Welcome back to the Social Impact Level Up podcast. This is where we blur the lines between business, nonprofit, and impact. I'm your host, Wendy V, and I'm a social impact strategist here to help you build a successful and sustainable legacy of social change. In this week's episode, we're going to hear from a social entrepreneur who has been on a journey to change the world just like you. If you are interested in social entrepreneurship, this is the place for you. Let's jump right into this week's episode. Hey everyone, it's me, Wendy B, your host, and I'm back with another episode of the Social Impact Level Up podcast. I'm here today with my friend, Clifton Corbin. He is somebody that I ran into, and I remember just every time I turned around, he was suddenly there (laughs) all of the time. And I thought, the universe wants us to be friends. We should become friends. So luckily, we have a lot of things in common and a lot of um, just the same energy, it seems like. So we instantly became friends. And this is one of my favorite people that I met at FinCon last year. And so I wanted to bring him on the podcast to talk a little bit more about what he does, how he inspires parents, and um, how he kind of recently revamped a very famous book. So (laughs) there are a lot of things that Clifton could talk about with us today, but I'm going to let him introduce himself first. Sure. Thank you for that, Wendy. And uh, yeah, the feeling is very mutual. Uh, My name is Clifton Corbin, uh, as Wendy mentioned. I'm the author of Your Kids, Their Money. I like to call myself a financial literacy advocate. So my thing is trying to help uh, parents teach financial literacy to kids and getting kids interested in financial literacy as well. So that's kind of what I do. And I'm super excited to chat with you. It feels like it's been way too, too long. Yeah, I know. And we were thinking, well, we'll just come and catch up and whatever we talk about is what the (laughs) podcast is about. (laughs) Works for me. Y'all are in for an interesting ride today. So Clifton, I think the last time I saw you, we were wandering around the halls of a hotel and trying to furiously get to different sessions to, you know, learn how to uplevel our craft of what we're doing. And so I just was curious, you know, what have you been able to to do in the last couple of months that I maybe haven't heard about, but also that people might be interested in? And also, um, if you can give just a highlight of what is your kids, their money? Sure. Oh, man, there's a few questions there. Um, let me start with the end of your question, then I'll move to the, to the, uh, the other parts there. Uh, so your kids, their money came about after I had some struggles with financial literacy in my, uh, early adulthood. So I like to call myself, you know, a a guy who was a money nerd before it was cool to put it on shirts. So when I was a kid, I loved money, couldn't learn enough about it, had a lot of early jobs, was really good at saving. But then I went off to university, got those early credit cards and just didn't know what I was doing. Got a lot of debt credit cards got canceled, credit score was ruined and all of the rest. And in sorting that all out, I was able to, uh, I like the word you use to level up my financial literacy and actually understand how the system works. And after I did that, I, I looked back and I was like, well, how do I help make sure that other people don't find themselves where I just was? Uh, and one of the things I realized uh, was that I needed to help parents teach these concepts, teach these habits, teach these skills to their children at an early age before you know, the credit cards come in before there's chances to make big, you know, um, like big messes with their, with their, with their finances, basically. So that was why I created your kids, their money. It's an attempt to help parents, you know, teach these skills and teach these, uh, these habits and, and, and get these concepts into, uh, into our young, young children. Uh, so that's why your kids, their money came about. So what have I been doing in the last couple of months since we connected? I have lots of podcasts, which has been great. I was able to make a lot of connections and get onto a lot of podcasts, but, uh, I'm working on, uh, doing another version of your kids, their money, which is actual workbook. Uh, cause a couple of parents have said, I love it. I would love to go deeper. So I'm working on a workbook. Uh, one of the things that came about after I put out your kids, their money was I started to become more aware of the fact that not everyone thinks the way I think, and I'm speaking specifically here around neurodiversity. So I want to do, uh, I want to revise the book with a more of a focus, especially specifically on ADHD. So I've been trying to dive a little deeper. And if you were on my website, cliftoncorbin.com, you'll see a few articles around ADHD. One of the people that I met at FinCon, I don't know if you met her, Tamika, she's, uh, she's done quite a bit of, uh, work with, uh, folks with ADHD. I believe she has ADHD herself. And she wrote a, a wonderful series for my blog, uh, on some, what it's like, some of the traits and what, what you could do to kind of manage, uh, money with ADHD. Uh, so I've been trying to go a little bit deeper there. Uh, and I'm, I think I mentioned to you, I'm working on an event that I'm hoping to hold either this year or early next year. 
I've uh, started working on a tabletop game. I mentioned that to you, I think, uh, at FinCon, but I've got the prototype now. It's done. I'm working on playtesting it. I think it's fun. It's another means to teach some of these concepts. Basically, what I'm trying to do is I understand that not every one, not everyone's the same. We're all very different. We all learn differently. We all have different ways of taking in this information. So I'm trying to come up with as many ways of presenting these concepts uh, so that people can take it in. So whether it's by playing a game or actually doing some uh, workbook type activities or just reading it, or maybe going to some type of experiential interactive event. So I'm trying to create all of these different platforms and different means of getting this con content into, uh, into the hands of the people who need it most. Man, now you're going to have me creating a game with some of my content. <laughs> I hope you do. I was just thinking about that. I was like, my sustainability framework would be a really fun day-long simulation. <laughs> I think you need to do it. I think you need to do it. I think so too. That's so great. And, and I love that you have the idea of neurodiversity in mind as well, because I know even when I do trainings and stuff, I always think about like different adult learning styles and who's in the room and how do people absorb information or how often do people need a break from information and just a lot of those decisions translating that into a product <laughs> like a game or a day-long training you know those are um those are big things to do so i'm excited for the work you're doing and i know you mentioned um revamping the book with a with a workbook i think that's a really cool idea because even your customers who you already connected with will be interested in in that product so it's almost like going um, a level deeper, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. still staying within that exact same silo <laughs> that you've already created. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, I think, and you're a creator, I'm a creator. I, like one of our challenges is like ideas aren't the challenge, right? It's how do you then take all of those ideas and figure out what's the next thing I should do with these ideas. And that's my, what's well, one of my challenges. I shouldn't speak for you, but that's one of my big challenges is that I always have you know, another idea. I could do this. I could do that. Like I've had a few in the last couple of hours of things I could and want to do, but we only have so much capacity. And as soon as we start taking on more of these things, and I think especially with the work that you do, when it comes to things that we know will have impact, like it's not just, I'm doing this, like, I'm not, I'm not doing any of this because I think it's going to make me wealthy. I hope I can get some, uh, some money forward the stuff I do because I, you know, I believe I'm providing value, but it's not about going out there so I can become super wealthy. It's going out there so that I can hopefully make a change, make a, make a difference in, in people's lives for, for the better. So when you know that you've got an idea that could do that, and you've got another idea that could do that and another idea that could do that, it's like, well, where do I focus? So I like what you said there, like, that's kind of what I thought as well. If I could stay in this space, at least for a little while, um, and develop as much as I can here. And then when, you know, I feel like I've done a good job, I could start doing something a little bit different, but what I'm doing in this space won't, won't ever change. Like it's something I, I can't see myself as I get older, as my life circumstances change, it's always going to be a passion of mine because it's so part of my story. Um, so I can't see that ever changing, but you're right. That's kind of some of the things I realized when I went through my book, I was like, throughout the book, you know, I ask questions and I, I try to help people get, like, I, like you said, deeper into the content, but I realized by having all of the rest of the content there, it's not a distraction, but if I were to just strip out those deeper questions, the ways to actually make sure you're, you're not just, you're not just reading it, but you're actually able to apply it. And I could just put that in a standalone, uh, a standalone workbook, then maybe that could help again, like you said, go a little bit deeper onto it and make sure that you know, they're getting exactly what they want out of it. And it's really cool because like you said, as a creator, I, I work on the process of helping people hone their ideas. <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> funny when I was like, yes, I do have a lot of people that I know, including myself, who have way too many ideas to execute and not enough time in the day and not enough um, manpower behind them because a lot of people are solo entrepreneurs who are right. just starting out. That's where I thought this podcast really could be a great vehicle to share information for people on how to navigate some of the pieces of social entrepreneurship, like the one that you just mentioned of too many ideas. And a lot of them are driven by the desire to make impact, right? right? Like it's like, I want to help people in this way, but I could do, you know, 15 different things to help people in 15 different ways, or I could do, I can help people do the same thing, but I can do it 15 different ways. Mm -hmm, you know, there's mm -hmm. just so many options there. And I think that sometimes people get caught up and they don't take action. So 
wh- how do you, when you're sitting in all those ideas, you just accumulated in the last few hours, <laughs> how do you decide and prioritize which of those ones you're going to take action on? I wish I had a great framework. And here's the challenge is that my background is business consulting. So if you were to come to me and say, I have all of these ideas, I don't know what to do. I would be able to come to you and say, here's a framework for you to, fr- for me to help you figure it out. But when it comes to me, it's like, well, they're all great. Um, like I said, one of the things I try to do is I want to stay true to my why. Like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? I am really focused on helping folks level up their financial literacy. So that's my why. Um, this is why I focused on the kids space. And this is why I updated the richest man in Babylon. I feel like it's a great resource for both kids and parents. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Then I need to figure out, well, what are a couple of using the, a couple of different variables? What are the things I have capacity to do? Cause I'm a stay at home dad. So, you know, if I'm, if the, if the, if the idea is to go out and do, you know, a hundred different talks, that's just not possible because I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm rooted to my home and that I have to go pick up the kids. I have to make dinner. I have to do the laundry, I have laundry. I have to get the groceries. So there's just physical limitations to what I can do. Um, and then what are the things that are going to make a lot of impact? And one of the things I like to focus on is what's something that's going to energize me. What's something I'm going to enjoy doing. So I try to use those as my, as my metrics to say, so what should I do next? Like a little while ago, I started a project. I was working on it and I was, I was really struggling with it. I was like, I don't know why I'm struggling so much with it. And then I realized it's, I wasn't super passionate about it. And it was almost like, I knew it was valuable. I knew it could help, but I feel like in that moment, I was more chasing the dollars and chasing the passion. And I said, no, you know what? I'm just going to shelve this for now and come back to it if I choose. And I'm going to focus on, and actually I stopped working on that. I started working on the workbook and I was like, it just, it took off. It was really quick. It was almost like. I knew what I needed to do. And I was like, the passion wasn't there for the first one. It was a good idea. And I may still come back to it because maybe that might change. But for me, it was because I'm lucky enough that I'm in this space where I can, you know, as a creator, you can focus on your passion not all the time. Sometimes you have to get paid. Uh, And sometimes getting paid isn't what your passion is going to be connected to. But I do feel like if you're doing something that has value, that can make an impact and passionate about it, that's a great meeting of metrics that could really help you to stay motivated to keep producing and hopefully get paid for that product as well so it's a hard question to answer and like i said if it was if it was me if you were asking me how do i help you i could probably come up with a bunch of different ways but when it's the other way around when the spotlight's on me it really makes a difference oh god i'm over here just giggling because i could see so much of myself in that answer i think um just figuring out things for other people being in the space of providing strategic services like I do and thinking about people's strategic plans it's always clear for me the road they should take mm-hmm. you know it's like they is not the problem yep. me is all the problems yep <laughs> <laughs> what I need to do it for myself and people that I've heard this for a lot of people this is why they hire a coach because mm-hmm. it's difficult for them to work themselves through a process they're familiar with. And I, and I agree. And I, I've hired several coaches for exactly that reason. And I think that um, what you said about like just finding the, the passion in it and the why and staying true to that. Every coach I've ever had has said the same exact thing, that it's all about your why and what you're passionate about, what you want to spend your time on. Of course, the money theoretically follows, but um, staying consistent and showing up, even when it's hard, those things are fueled by your passion exactly. and your why. Exactly. So have you had a time where you remember you're like, man, I'm about to just give it all up and do something on else? You know what? I've, that happened lots of times before I started working on this. Like I said, my passion for helping folks with financial literacy hasn't changed. And it's, it's interesting because I was working on This was before I wrote my book. I was working on something else and I was talking to a friend of mine and I remember him looking at, like, we're talking about what we're working on. He's another creative. He's, you know, like writes screenplays and he does all this other creative work. And we were chatting about what we're all working on and I was telling him what I was doing. And then I was like, you know, at some point I might want to do some stuff on the financial literacy thing. And he looked at me, he's like, it's obvious where your passion is, right? Like he could tell that the thing I was working on, it was something I was interested in. Yes, but it wasn't something I was passionate about. And he's like, you know, you light up when you talk about this, you keep talking about this. Like I've known him for 20 plus years. He's like, this is something you've been talking about for years. He's like, you need to do this and you should do it now. And I was like, you're right. I should do it now. So that's when I made the pivot. But 
whenever I'm in those moments where it's like, why, why am I struggling so much with this thing? It's, it's usually because it's something I don't like doing. It's, it's as simple as that. And it gets back to the, <clears throat> pardon me, it's the, uh, the concept of, you know, sometimes it's the who, not how, right? So if you're doing something and you realize, well, maybe I shouldn't be the one doing this, even in your own, uh, in your own business or your own projects, it's, you know, let's say I'm working on my website. I don't typically like working on my website. Maybe I should hire, you know, a web designer to do this. And then I've outsourced that. It's going to be done quicker. It's going to be done better. Uh, and then I can focus on the things that I do like, and I will be able to add more value for those things that I really like, as opposed to these things that aren't so much, you know, my thing. Um, so I'm, I'm similar to you too, as Wendy. And that one of the things that I can't help but do when I connect with someone is I go through those, like, well, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? So I'm one of the things I'm probably going to do in the next few years after, you know, I, I get this. The, uh, my book and the workbook and all these other things kind of in a good place is I want to go back into like the coaching and consulting, especially with financial, uh, content creators, because I feel like there's so many of us who kind of like find ourselves as like, uh, I've been calling them accidental entrepreneurs, right? Like you, you write a book and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well now I'm doing speaking and okay, now I'm writing a course and now I'm writing a workbook and all of a sudden you've got all these administrative things around you. And you didn't like you're in it and you're loving it because it's something that you like to do. I'm, I'm talking about my own experience here right now, but you didn't think about all of the other business pieces around it, right? Like you didn't go into it with the idea that you're starting a business, but what you've done is you've created a business. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the folks in that space, they can really use some help. Uh, and it's one of those things I do naturally anyway. So when I connect with someone, I'm like, okay, so who's your target? Who's your target demographic? Like, I can't help it. So it's probably something I'm going to get back into in the, in the near future. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, you you kind of have the like innate coach vibe. So I, I agree. <laughs> well, it is suitable for your talents. And I think the the part about social entrepreneurship that's also interesting is sometimes people just follow their passion and that leads, like you said, to accidental ent entities that they have hmm. to use to formalize that, right? To to be a legitimate entrepreneur and to mm -hmm. be able to show up in spaces and say, this is how I make an impact or this is what I'm doing or this is why you should buy my thing or whatever it is. And you don't realize some of the steps along the way that you accidentally get roped into, because I think I was the opposite. I was like, I'm starting a business. And then I got roped into being a content creator. And I mm -hmm. was like, oh, so this is what marketing and branding and PR is all about. Okay. I was over here just thinking people just bought stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, and if you don't know marketing, you have no idea how much content you're going to be generating as a solopreneur. So I think that it goes both ways. You know, you never know what to expect, but it's all kind of part of the beauty of the journey. Mm -hmm. And I don't know oh, if yes. you find that as well. Oh, yeah. I, I say that often, like the learning is in the journey. It's, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I find what your example is the, maybe the exception. I don't know, maybe a lot of people go in with the wanting to start the business, but what can happen is you go in, you create the thing, and then you miss a bunch of steps where it's like, well, wait a minute, I don't know who my target demographic is. I don't know what platform I should be focusing on. I don't have a communication plan or even a business plan for that matter. I don't know how I'm going to do all of these business steps because you didn't go into it with the idea of starting a business, but you're right. The business happens to be the vehicle that you need to create to actually distribute what you do. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how we kind of fumble into these, into these roles. And then I love like what you do is wonderful, like creating a space to coach folks who want to like spread their impact, it really does help like the, the concept of coaching. And I don't think, I think when we go through, you know, the elementary school system, we have teachers and that's fine and it works, but unless you're in, let's say on a team, you don't really get the concept of a coach and how a coach can actually help move you along in a specific space. So I love the idea of coaching because it really is, it really can't help move you along. We were talking before, I think you hit record about folks who really leveled up and were able to move a lot faster and a lot further and spread a lot more and maybe even scale even faster because they decided to use a coach as opposed to try to figure all these things out on their own. And you can figure it out on your own, but with the aid of a coach, someone who's seen it before or could help maybe hone your, your concepts or your, your thinking or your, your direction, it really can't help move you further along. So what you do is, is wonderful. And I think that is a type of service. And no, I, you know how much I love you. I and mean, it's, that's not me. <laughs> But what you do, especially since you focus so much on the social piece, the social impact, as opposed to just, you know, business impact, it's wonderful in that 
when we do things for a social good, that scales on its own, right? Like if you, you know, rejuvenize a playground, like the, the winning just, it, it scales and it grows and it replicates and it's exponential. So doing social good just has so much more impact or can have so much more impact. So having a coach who's there for you to help you in that space, and it's not just the business piece, it's also the, the messaging and all of it. It's wonderful. So that's why, I've, again, I, we talked in the beginning why we connected so much is because I really like what you do and I love how you've decided to focus on that space because it's a space that I think often gets overlooked because it's not as flashy as being like a business coach. Yeah. And, and I think that, and pers personally, I appreciate your commercial for my services. I'm going <laughs> to use it to, to promo myself over there. Please do. But I, I think it's great also because the opportunity to, um, to have that ripple effect, right? Like the, you know that your work is going to carry on for other people to do other things that are amazing. And even if they take the things that they taught you and they taught like one other person, that will make a big difference. And so I, I see that part of it in both of our work as well. It's like you're teaching these parents how to talk to these children, but theoretically that'll help break some of the generational cycles about money and money trauma and also connecting back to my work as well with the parallel. I focus a lot on BIPOC communities, people of color, people who have experienced these kinds of generational traumas and how do we use social impact as a way to move past that? And you use financial literacy as a way to do that same exact thing. And so I think that's another piece that that we share is this perspective of like, how can we um, really start uplifting the next generations and be able to provide the supports, the services, the healing, the opportunities, like all of those things for the next generation of people to do what they need to do, follow their passions and bring their talents to the world. I love it. The word that comes to my mind is legacy. And it's not even just our legacy. It's the legacy of the people that we're helping, right? Like if you've got a, uh, a child, if you, let's say you're a parent and you've got a child and you're like, well, what's the legacy I want to leave behind it? It's knowledge, it's, it's, it's empowerment, it's agency, it's all of these things. And if you could do that through, for me, it's financial literacy. If you can make them feel like I'm going to leave you as a, you know, money confident young person who can take on the world. And there's no way that you're going to, you know, take on the world without having an understanding of money. It's, 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 it's so essential. So that's why it's one of the things I focused on. Now, if you have that, yeah, they're going to set up not just themselves, but they'll set up their families. They'll set up the people around them. They'll set up the businesses that they interact with, the communities that they interact with. And like you said, it ripples out and it just continues to ripple. So it's not leaving that legacy. And again, I'm not talking about my legacy, but I'm helping other people leave a legacy behind that they can be proud of. And that's what, you know, like I said, that's what motivates me and, and really energizes me. It's so clear too with both of our businesses, because I say the same exact thing. It's about the legacy of social change that you want to see and how do you want to leave the world different mm -hmm. with something that kind of lives on beyond you. But I think if you are able to do that for young people in their finances, that's going to really transform lives because it transforms people's opportunities to thrive in the future exactly. um, and then be able to pass that information on to future generations as, as our society changes you know, and evolves. So. That's really cool. And, then, and so speaking of this, but in total backwards fashion, because I'm going to go <laughs> and like, it's related, but not really. Um, the idea of the richest man in Babylon. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of conversations in here that are parallel to what we're talking about. So I'm going to bring it out now. You recently edited the book, right? You, and I, I thought this was interesting because I was like, you know, I don't even, man, this man's so smart. I mean, I'm not doing this. <laughs> you took a book that's already well known and is also dated mm -hmm. and you altered it for not only the knowledge or, or language that we use now but also this perspective of gender identity person versus man being in the title like all these other things so i am very curious for you to just unleash this information <laughs> on us about how this came about what did you do what what are the principles behind it you know sure. like all the things because it's just such a great um example of what we were just talking about sure so the richest man in babylon it's i would say anyone in the personal finance space they know this book they know it well it's uh it's, it's beloved by many of us it's beloved by me it's one of the books i recommend to so many people and because i recommend it to so many people a few about a year ago 
uh, maybe a, a little less than that. I was trying to, I was, you know, I, was, I have two kids. My son is, he's 10 now. At the time he was nine. We didn't have a book to read. And I was like, you know what? My favorite book, I'm going to make it your favorite book. I'm going to read The Richest Man in Babylon to you. And he's like, okay. So I grabbed my copy and I started reading it to him. And like within the first page or two, his eyes just like glassed over. And he's like, you could tell he had no idea what I was talking about. Like it just, it didn't make any sense. And if anyone's read the book, they know that the way it was written, it was written with, you know, some people call it Shakespearean language. Some people say, it, like, I don't know. I call it like verbal flourishes. Like it's, it's written with like thou with and, and do with and all of that. And it's just, it's not an easy book to understand. And then on top of that, when I read it again, from the perspective of a dad, I was like a dad in the 21st century. I was like, every character here of note is male. Even the characters that aren't male, even not even just the characters, but like every object, everything is like got the male pronoun. And I was like, it, it, it kind of irked me. Like it didn't read right. And like, I, I know like the book was written in 1926. So obviously it's got some of that datedness to it. But I realized like for a book that I'm recommending to so many people, it's hard for me to recommend it now when I realize how it could come across as just being like really gender specific. And I was like, I don't love it. Um, and I know it's got the richest man in the title, but it just, it didn't fit. Um, so I said, okay, well, I talked to, um, uh, a lawyer and I was like, I know this book's about a hundred years old. And he's like, yep, the, the copyright is run out. So you can do whatever you want with it in the public domain. And I was like, oh, well, okay. So I took that. Yeah. Like I said, ideas always kind of coming up. And when I heard that one, I was like, okay. I'm going to revise it. I'm going to revise it to have more modern language. I'm going to revise it to be easier to read. But then I thought, I was like, well, I, I want to make sure that it's easy to read. Like I want, I don't want to like, you know, revise it and then like give it to a couple of, you know, beta readers and have them come back and say, yeah, it is, it isn't. So I was like, so I went to my son and I was like, Hey, do you want to read, do you want to work on this project with me? And he's like, sure. So what we did is I would read a couple lines. And if I got that glassy look in his eyes, I was like, okay, you don't know what I'm saying. And I'd revise it. I'd rewrite it. And I'd read it back to him. And if he was, if he was like, oh no, I know what they're saying. And I need to live off of less than I make. And I was like, done. We're keeping that in. And I went through that for the whole book. And then I got the final product, sent it off to the editor. And, and there you go. I've got the, uh, the revised version now. Oh my God. That's so cool. It's, it's funny. You know, people don't even think about that things that are in public domain. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, the, the, that was like a, a pivotal moment. I was like, you know, I, I'm picturing in my head, I'm like, what if somebody redid Think and Grow Rich too? <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that one. That one also, and if anyone's out there who's interested, it's also in the public domain. I read that mm -hmm. one and I was also thinking similar thoughts, but it, I, as much as I like Think and Grow Rich, it's not. I don't. So one of the reasons I love The Richest Man in Babylon, it's not, and I, I said this to someone recently and they looked at me like, are you sure? I was like, no, I, I'm listening. It's not about becoming wealthy. That's not what The Richest Man in Babylon is about. Yes, in The Richest Man in Babylon, you have all of the skills, habits, uh, stories to become wealthy. But why I love and resonated so much with The Richest Man in Babylon, the story itself is about a wealthy person educating and teaching people on how to become wealthy. The story, all of the stories within the story, because the, uh, the Richest Man in Babylon is a bunch of parables, it's a bunch of short stories. Almost every one of those stories is a teacher and a student. And the teacher is teaching the student about skills, habits, things they've done, trials and tribulations in their life. And they're teaching through, you know, their experiences. So the book is really about teaching. And I think that's why I resonated so much with the book. That's why I like that. That's why I love that book so much is because while, yes, you can learn how to be wealthy from that book. And if you follow the lessons and the, and the, 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 different stories in the book you will become wealthy like it just it's true you will but the book itself it's really a story about how to teach and i love that i think why i resonated so much with the book and thinking grow rich great book no knock on thinking grow rich but it's not the same for me no it's not and i think that a lot of the stories like i would like to see that with more modern stories of um self-made people in uh the digital age Mm -hmm. That would be my idea for the, so whoever is listening, get on yes, it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> get this idea while it's hot. Because yeah, the book is basically, it's a story about mentoring. Like that's what the, that's what the book is. It's a, 
this is a mentor relationship. I'm going to teach you how to become wealthy and I'm going to give you a lesson. And then you're going to practice like the, the main story, the, the quintessential story in the book is about uh, a person who desired to become wealthy. They met someone who was wealthy and said, I will do something for you if you teach me how to become wealthy. And then that person became this person's mentor. And then all of the stories kind of evolve around that. And that's, that's what, again, it's, it's what we're talking about. It's what we're talking about before you said we we're pivoting. We're not pivoting. We're still talking about the same thing. It's talking about how you can help create a legacy of self-empowerment, right? Like it's about helping people help themselves. And it, that's why I, I was such a big fan of the book and why I was so excited to work on it. Yeah. And it, it is all about creating a legacy of empowerment, right? Because that's the same thing with community impact work. Like we're working on how to put people in the place to be empowered for their own future, their own choices or what they need to do to thrive. And so it, I think whether you're looking at finances or personal development or all of these things, it's all wrapped up into our holistic wellness, right? Like everything, we don't just sort of operate on one, as much as we think, you know, oh, go to the gym and just be healthy or go eat right and just be healthy or, oh, you know, just sleep well and drink water. Like there's never really one answer. There's so many different ways to think about how can we not only thrive in what we're doing right now, but then in the future <laughs> as well, our legacy. So it's all, yeah, it's, it's all kind of wrapped up in there. And I think that's why I love financial wellness as a topic. And I always make sure that there's space to talk about this because it's such a big part of people's mental health journey, their um, decisions on, on occupation and their occupational wellness and how people um, make decisions about, you know, their household. I mean, so much of it comes back to your financial stability, your financial ability to, to provide or your ability to grow wealth. And so I, I think that it's just such an important topic. Um, so I wanted to ask you, thinking about your wellness and mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, being a stay-at-home father, doing all of these other wonderful things you're doing, how do you maintain your ability to pour into other people? And what do you do for yourself? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's tricky. Like, I can't say everything's great all the time. Like, there's times where... You know, there's, there's a lot going on. There's these activity, extracurricular with one kid and extracurricular with another kid. And, you know, there's a lot going on. I, I like to give myself a lot of downtime. Like I have no problem in the middle of the day, grabbing my lunch, turning it on Netflix and being like, this is what I'm doing for the next hour and a half. Just leave me alone. Like, I'm not like, I don't care. I'm just taking a moment for myself. And I try to do that regularly, um, just because I know I'm so if you go back to, let's say, um, middle of the pandemic where the kids were home and it was just, was, it was madness. And I was at that point where I realized, like, I'm a very outgoing, gregarious person. Like, I, I, I'm, my cup gets filled by meeting people like yourself and just connecting with people. But it wasn't until that point that I realized I also need solitude. Um, I need time to myself with my own thoughts without anything going on, whether that's you know, going for a walk and I don't love going for a walk. I really just like being in my house with nothing else going on, like just chilling. Uh, but it wasn't an option during the pandemic. So I, to be honest, like that was a bad time for me because I was stressed out. I was anxious. Like we all were, uh, but more so because the thing that I need to, uh, to moderate that and to alleviate that I couldn't get, I couldn't get time to myself and us like the solitude in my home. So that's one of the things, if you're asking like, what are the things I do for myself? It's now, especially now that I've recognized that's something I need. And it's something I just used to get naturally just because of the way, you know, the, the world works, you know, my wife would go out for work and I would come home and I'd get it. Now she works from home a lot more. So now I just need to go out and seek moments to myself. So I go to the gym. I don't love it. I'm, uh, I just signed up for a mini triathlon that will get me, you know, active, physically active, but there's, if I was saying the thing that I need the most to kind of regulate and get what I need it's moments of solitude. Um, so what I end up doing, which is probably not good is I'll do that where I I'll stay up later while everyone's asleep, just so I can have that time to myself, but then I don't get enough sleep. So it's a double-edged sword and that like, I get the solitude, but I lose the sleep. So, you know, we're all, we're all trying to figure it out and I'm still trying to figure it out too. Yeah, no, it's, there's so much truth in what you were saying. I was thinking about the pandemic. It's like, what's the hardest thing in the world you could do? try to stay home all the time, but <laughs> that's the yeah, that was exactly. just 
for some reason, you know, that a lot of us who are like, oh, I don't mind being at home. It's fine. And then you're like, but stay there all the time. Oh, no. 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 <laughs> what? No. And as much as I love my family and I do love my family, I, like I said, I get energized by connecting and meeting new people and hearing about what they're doing and how they're, you know, giving back or what their challenges are. And maybe I can do a little problem solving or troubleshooting. Like that is what gets me energized. And if I don't have a way of getting out and meeting people, then I also struggle. So it's, I need a combination. Like we're all, we're complex people, right? So I need some time where I'm meeting new people, where I'm getting to connect, where I'm doing stuff like this, where I'm having a conversation with a good friend. And I also need that time where I'm just like nothing. I've got nothing going on. And then of course I want the time where I'm spending it with my family and where we're doing stuff together. So, you know, it's trying to do all of those things. And I also get very energized by the work that I do. Like I enjoy writing. I enjoy doing, uh, you know, some of the promotions for my book. So all of those things come into it. Uh, earlier today, I met with uh, a couple of parents because we're trying to re revitalize uh, the school playground. So all of that, all of that helps to uh, to help regulate me because it's all creative and it's all the rest. But again, then if I, if I had to say what's the one thing that I need that I have a hard time getting, it's that those moments of solitude. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great example too of how do you fit it all in. Right. There's only so many hours in the day and there's so many competing priorities and there's only one of you. <laughs> and there's a bunch of other things. I want to flip that question on you. What do you need and what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I've reformatted my life in the last couple of years to be what I call a wellness first lifestyle. Right. So my wellness is something I think about every single day and I make time for it. I have it in my sc my schedule. It's like blocked out. And I try to stick to those routines that I put in place because they bring me high value and high return in my overall health, well-being, mental health, like all of that stuff, all the outcomes I want. And they're kind of my core foundational activities. So what I've done is it's developed myself a wellness recipe. So those core foundational activities I focus on every single week that includes my gym time and my work at home time my walks with the dog, you know, like hiking, like all these things that I try to fit into my week on a regular basis. For a while there, there was a 10 mile bike ride that I would do once a week because I was like, this is part of my wellness recipe. That's great. Uh, but then the weather changed and I moved from the trails, like all those other things happened. So, so you, you reformat your wellness recipe according to the changes in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Like you create it, you then kind of go a little ways with it and you see. And then the second part of it is besides those foundational activities, it's the what is still scary to me? Like what will really help me maintain a growth mindset or what mm. will really help me move forward? And it doesn't have to be something super scary, like jumping out of a plane, but it could be like, for example, for me last year, I had fallen two years ago, I fell into a lake while stand up paddleboarding. Mm. And so I wanted to get over it and I need to get over my fear of water, but that's a different fear. And so I said, I want to get over my fear of stand-up paddleboarding. And so I bought a paddleboard last year and I spent the entire summer paddleboarding. And I was like you, like when I needed those moments of solitude, I would hop out on the board. I would paddle out to the middle of the lake and I would be unseen for several hours. That's and like, great. you can't, you can't reach me because my cell phone's not with me. You can't, if it, unless you're paddling out there with me, you're not going to find me. Right. right. No, that's great. <laughs> yeah. And so those are the kinds of things that I started putting in place for myself as like, what are the foundational pieces I need? What are the things that are still scary slash will help me grow in this lifetime? And there are still experiences that I want to have and I'm willing to have, but I need to make the space for them. And what I was not doing before was making the space for them. I was mm -hmm. staying afraid or staying, staying um, on the side of fear of something new versus creating space for new all the time. So it's no longer scary. And would you say you've been able to create habits around those things? Or is it more like in my week, I'm going to make sure I do these five things? Or is it like in my day, I am going to do this and then this and then this? How, how do you usually make it work? Yeah. How do I fit them in? That's a good question. I usually set goals for myself and I kind of keep them for a while till they either get into a routine or I find that I don't need them in a routine and they're not as valuable to me as I thought. And so, for example, um, one of my goals at one point was to frequent the farmer's markets and start working with vegetables I'd never eaten before. Mm. 
And I figured, one, it'll get you out of that childish fear that I don't need Brussels sprouts because they're soggy, <laughs> right? And two, it gets me into like a healthier lifestyle where yes. I'm exploring more food options that widen my ability to intake, you know, vitamins and things I need, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And so I did this for about two summers. I would go every Saturday religiously look for vegetables that I've never worked with before. I mean, I'm buying like sun chokes, right? That's great. Yeah. Why not figuring out how to make sun chokes, you know, like all these different things. And then eventually I realized that there's several vegetables I really enjoy mm-hmm. and they provide me a lot of value. And I was able to incorporate those into my diet on a regular basis. And now, you know, I don't have to explore as much because I've done so much exploring. So I can really just work on bringing those into routine. So that's kind of how I do it is like I find a time when I'm really going to work on that thing. And that's then. Nice. If it fits nicely into my lifestyle, I incorporate it in. If it doesn't, I am grateful for the experience and I move on. I like that. No, I like how you've, you you incorporated the goal into your everyday now. The goal itself no longer serves a purpose. Like it would actually probably take away from your joy. Like if you feel like it's a chore to go to a farmer's market, well, then we don't go to the farmer's market, right? But you've found a way to incorporate the things that really were valuable in that goal into your day-to-day so you can let go of that quote-unquote goal at this point that's great yeah because now i just buy those vegetables at the regular grocery store with it. right <laughs> <laughs> to a little do, bit of money yeah. too yeah yeah i mean well no it's actually the farmer's market's cheaper in maryland this is oh, the crazy well, thing go. yeah it's it's buy small if you live in maryland you know because it's like uh the groceries here have, have not recovered from the pandemic the quality is awful and also the prices are awful <laughs> Thank you sharing that. No, that's great. Yeah. I like how you've, uh, you've been able to find a way to, I, I like that. Like, I also try to set goals here and there, but I don't think I've done it as systematically as I think the way you describe it. It sounds a lot more systematic and a lot more intentional with the lifestyle goals. Like I said, a lot more, uh, let's say business type goals. Uh, and every now and then I do some of the lifestyle ones I mentioned, like doing a triathlon and stuff like that. Um, uh, but something as, as. I don't want to say simple, but as simple as saying, I'm going to go to this space and incorporate the the produce that I find here. Like, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, no, thanks. And I, and I like the idea of um, once you have a habit, you know, reinforcing that habit and sticking with it, but mm-hmm. then also, you know, letting yourself have space to assess, does this habit really benefit me? Because sometimes we try something new and we're like, oh, we got to like do it. And you do it in full force for a little while. And then all of a sudden you find yourself slipping away from it again. And I think sometimes that happens because we haven't assessed if that was actually valuable for yeah. us. Yeah. And we become dogmatic happened. about it, but not for any real reason. Like we're just like, well, I need to do this thing. And it's like, well, does that make sense for you in this month? Yeah, I like what you're I, I like what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then that's why I I always try to work with people's Um, wellness as well when we're working on coaching because sometimes people don't have the space in their life to make the impact they want to make and they can see it clearly in their ideas and they see it in their head and they're like it's going to be great but when it comes down to it like you said there's kids they're you know our spouse or whatever you know other person that needs attention in our lives there's other you know house commitments like all these other things neighbor and when you don't when you give your time to all of those things and you don't have space to make the impact that you want, that can actually feel very unfulfilling for people. <laughs> right. So you have to create space in your life for all the different things. Well, if I could use a phrase from the richest man in Babylon, like the concept of paying yourself first, right? Like the idea of when you make money, you need to make sure that you, you know, save some of it before you spend it on any other thing. The same can be true for energy for wellness and all the rest. And it's one of the things that I've said I want to focus on this year. And I don't know if I've done a great job of it yet, but it's something that I've been thinking about more actively in that it's great to, especially, and I, I'm sure your community more so than other, it's great to give of yourself. And, you know, there's so many great things that come from that, even just the feeling of I've made an impact, I've made a change, I've made a, a positive thing in this world. But if you give too much of yourself and you don't take care of yourself, then it's not, it's, it's not for naught. Unlike if it was just, let's say something that's more frivolous, but you know, you need to pay yourself first with energy and wellness and all of the rest. And it's something that I, like I said, in the last year or so, I realized, especially after the pandemic, it's like things got really haywire there for a little bit. I'm like chocolate and chips on the couch every day is not going to get me where I want to be. Um, but 
doing those things and making sure that you still are the priority, not just, you know, the work that you do, but your actual physical self is a priority. That's something that we, I think we could all take away. Well, I'm not going to knock chocolate and chips during a pandemic. <laughs> I, I was right here with you, Obi, with the, the chocolate bars stashed and the chips in the bed in the cupboard. Yep. Like, it is, and I, it, it, it's interesting to have a shared um, experience. I don't know that in our lifetime that you can recall how many times we've had like these shared experiences, but there's certain moments that people of our age range will remember things like the Rodney King trial. Or, you know, different, like, just moments where you're like, oh, okay, 9-11, like, we're, we were all... The white Bronco. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, like, we were all in the same space, watching the same thing, going, what? But the pandemic was, like, so brutal, (laughs) because it was all of us in it together, Mm -hmm. and all of us trying to figure it out. So it it is interesting to reflect back on how different people had similar experiences, and food in particular was one of them that I think a lot of us had that same experience of, like, Eh, this is not going to last very long. Let's just stock our fridge with whatever oh, yeah. it is we don't ever let ourselves eat. Like I, t- I, I even mentioned it in my book. Like I have, I, I was, I think in my book I mentioned how a couple of years ago. So I'm in Toronto. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Raptors made it to the finals and won the the championship. And in that year, I think I gained I don't know, and just in the playoffs, like five ten pounds because I was just so emotionally in, like vested in this team, which is a ridiculous thing to say. I know, but I was. I emotionally eat. I know I do. It's something that I am aware of. Now you say, well, you said it, like, it's just going to last for a little bit. Like you have this pandemic and it's like, well, I need to feel better. I'm not allowed to go anywhere. I can't do anything. So yeah, I, I use food to comfort myself, which in a moment is okay. But over the space of a couple of years is not so great. So I'm vain for it now. Um, but yeah, it's it's just you're not the only one who had like a <laughs> couple of years an idea. It's like, oh, it's just a few months and you're like, yeah, it's been about like nine months now. <laughs> I've been eating like trash. <laughs> That's funny. Oh man. Well, I could definitely sit ch- ch- chat with you all day, but I wanted to get to a couple of last questions. Um so first and first question is in your experience as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur who's really focused on helping others, not so much just on profit. What has been the biggest challenge that you've had to navigate? Oh, it's wanting to give, not always putting the value on yourself or your time. So great example. Uh, I was just asked to talk uh, at a school. I love talking at schools, talking to a parent community at a school. Uh, and it's like, well, this is how much I charge for a talk and like, what can you do it for cheaper? And I was like, yeah, I, I could do it for cheaper. And then, you know, they start asking around like, well, this group can do it for free. Will you do it for free? And I was like, well, technically, yes, I could do it for free because my end goal is to make sure that this community has this knowledge. But if I do it for free, then I am devaluing myself, which is, you know, most times I'm, it's, it's such a, it's such a, such a mind bending thought. Like you want to give, you need to give, and it's like in you to help. But if you don't charge anything for it, then you will not have the capacity to continue to give. So you need to have some type of boundaries there. Um, so I would say that's one of the biggest challenges is that making sure that you're, you're actually recouping some of the value that you're putting out there, which is so hard when you're doing something that you want to do. You want to do it altruistically. You just want to give it. Like if I, like the amount of times I've just been like, here, just take this, just have that. And if it was like a recording, I'm fine, whatever. But if I have to then say, I am going to forego tuck in time to meet with this parent community, which I would have to do, I'm giving up something very valuable there. And I'm also providing something very valuable in that my time and the content that I speak on and the subject matter that I speak on is valuable. So there's a lot of value that I'm giving or foregoing. And if the compensation for that is a thank you and a pat on the back, it might not be worth my time. But at the same time, the value, like I want, I want to provide this, like it's something I want to give, but I, so that's a challenge. That's just a a challenge that I have. And I, I kind of stayed firm. I was like, well, I will discount it. Sure. But then I'm I'm done. Um, and I don't know if it will, if it will come back to me or not. I, and I said, and I, I said this earnestly, if you can get the same type of content for free and it's a matter of budget for your, your school community, then I want you to get the content. If you don't get it. And I say this on podcast, I say this all the time. Like if you're seeking out information on financial literacy and you say, you know what, Clifton, I like what you're doing, but I can't afford your book. 
is there any other resources out there? I'm like, if you can go to my blog, you know, that's for free, you know, cliftoncorbin.com slash blog. It's all there. It's free. Or go find someone else, find a podcaster, find the resource that works for you, um, no matter where you're getting it from. And I said this to the same school. I was like, if you want, if you can get equal value for less and it ma it's a matter of your budget, then go for it. Because what matters to me is that you're getting this content. But then at the same time, I don't get paid for that. So it's such a hard life. It's it's almost like you would give it for free just because the value that you know it has for someone else and altruistically that is the goal. But again, you need to eat. You need your kids need to eat. Like there's all these other yeah. pieces in there too. Yeah. And I and I totally agree. I've had the same exact thing. People going, well, well, can't you just help me learn grant writing for free or write this grant for me for free, and then we'll pay you after we get the grant? And I was like. That's not exactly how this works. But <laughs> the, I, what I love is there's a more sustainable answer of you getting the skill and doing it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like this is, this is where we need to be talking about. Like I can teach you the sustainable route so you can go do for yourself. And that's usually my answer back to people with that. It's like, you know, there's a, I can do for you at this rate or I can give you the tools to do for yourself. Exactly. And, you know, but with something like a book, it's such a small investment. But yeah. I think with the speaking fee, that's where, yeah, the bigger investment, maybe some groups are like, eh, can't do it. And I, and I know that I've even talked to other speakers who have, we've had this constant thing of like when people ask you to speak, but they expect it to be free. And it's like, but then I'm paying for my travel to yeah. come to you, to talk to you for free. <laughs> like, there's, how does oppor there's, <laughs> there's opportunity costs too, right? Like if I'm going to speak to you it means i'm not doing something else so let's just say it was a talk in the middle of the day well that means i'm not working on a blog post that means i'm not working on my new book that works that means i'm not working on my event it means i have to give up something to give you something you know we hear that all the time you say yes to something you're saying no to something else so i am now even if i did it for free and i've given lots of talks for free and i'm sure i'll give more talks for free because that's just who i am but Every time I do that, again, it's taking away something else. So they're just using that example that I made. So let's say I, this is a ridiculous example. I give the talk for free, but it means, you know, the updated version of my workbook, it, my workbook isn't done for another six months, something stupid like that. That's six months of time that other people could have been getting value from me because I gave up an hour here. Again, that example is ridiculous, but you get the concept. By saying no, by saying yes here, I'm actually not able to provide value in other places and that value like we already talked about the ripple effect the exponential effect of it so it, it's such a it's a tough one because again we want to provide value we want to like it's in ourselves to give and to serve so when someone says can you just give and serve for nothing you want to say yes but you can't well you can't always say yes or i guess you could but well, uh, that's where i had another guest victor morgan he, his thought was um you can say yes to those kinds of opportunities if you have other streams of income that allow yes. you to do so. And yes. he was talking about real estate investments and other things that he has in his portfolio. And his advice for social entrepreneurs was diversify your yeah. income streams and make sure that you have the ability to say yes to those things that you want to say yes to at yeah. a discounted or free rate, which I think is a great, excellent thought. But a lot of us are all trying like, well, where, where am I getting this? Where, like, how am I, where is this passive income train coming from? <laughs> I agree with that. I a hundred percent agree with that, but I still think, I think we still attribute value, like value and money are linked together. Right? So if I have all of the passive income streams around me to sustain me and truly right now, I don't need, it's not about the money. It's not that I need the money to sustain my, like, we're good. We're okay. Um, I don't need to, you know, have the speaking gig to be okay. It's not about that. It's what is my time worth? And it's almost a psychological thing to say, I am worth this. I could, I, if I'm willing, I could volunteer that. And then you go, I can say it's an in-kind gift of X amount, uh, but I'm still gifting it to you because I'm worth that. I think it's important that as entrepreneurs, especially as entrepreneurs that fo focus so much on social giving and social impact, that we still say our time, our, our gifts, our skills have value. And the way that our community shows value and demonstrates value is by paying. So I have value that I am not willing to say is zero 
in a pro bono talk. I do do it from time to time and I will do it if it makes sense, if there's huge impact that I can provide, um, but on a small setting, again, that's the other thing, right? Like in a smaller setting, doing that isn't going to, and again, it's not about the dollars and cents into my pocket book. It's really about saying, well, what's my value? What? And I hope to do more talks. I hope to give more, you know, more uh, engagements like this. Each one of those, have to, I have to say it's valuable. Because if I say it's not valuable, if I say I can do it for free, what really is the value for someone else to book me? They're like, well, you're, you don't have, what's your value? If you if you say you can do it for free, you don't have value. So it's that, it's that recognizing that we as entrepreneurs have a value and the way that we demonstrate that is by charging. No, I love that. And, and valuing your, ev evaluating yourself and valuing yourself is very hard. Mm -hmm. Because I've done the same thing, you know, thinking about as a speaker, what is your speaker fee or what is your consulting fee or what is, you know, your hourly rate for something. And it's, you know, you're sitting there trying to calculate it. But a lot of it, like you said, is about your confidence and your knowledge and your delivery and the style and the way that you give something does have a value. Even if you can find the same information on a blog post or on a whatever, it doesn't mean that that blog post is going to answer every question in the room. But if you're standing there answering every question in the room, you are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it is it is hard to say, well, what is that worth, right? Like what extra value is that ability to ask whatever question you have on your mind? What is that worth to you? And are you able to get me in the room so that I can provide that value to you? And that cost to get me in the room is the speaker fee right here. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it, it is like a, it's, it's, a, it's a weird mindset to go through as you're thinking about it in your entrepreneurship journey. So I, I appreciate the dig into this topic because I'm sure there's some people who are thinking this as, you know, speakers or as people wanting to bring in other streams of income. How do you even decide, you know, what your price is for these kinds of things? And I know that that's something that... Um, I had to work through pr pretty much in the last like year was the, the pricing and the services and all of that. And, and to what is that worth and the opportunity cost? And even like you said, what is the opportunity cost of creating this workbook versus working on my in-person mm -hmm. versus, you know, how many people am I serving with this versus how many people am I serving with this? It's all in there. And when you're a solo entrepreneur, the reason we get lost in our own muck is because we're thinking about all of it. All at the of same it. Time. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. And <laughs> Just to go a little further on that, like our, like if you are, like there's so many times that I volunteer and when I volunteer, none of these thoughts come into my head. Like at no point when I'm volunteering, am I thinking, but my hourly rate could be like, I don't think that, but when you're asking me to do something that I have dedicated myself to do, I've honed these skills, I've read books, I've taken the courses, you're asking me to use my, myself. Like, I find it's really hard for a lot of people to say to the, that same comment you made, like. When we have to say, well, how much am I going to charge for my services? A lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs have a hard time with it. And it's because there's a huge pressure to devalue who you are and what you can do both externally and internally, right? Like we have a lot of that self doubt. Well, I've only been doing this for however long, and I'm not as big as that person. And I've not done it in this venue. Like there's a lot of self doubt that can come in that will devalue what you're worth. And then externally, everyone's trying to find a deal. So you get that on both sides. But I think it's, it's imperative that as entrepreneurs, that we push against both of those forces and say, no, I am worth this because I want to do this. Like you're by charging for it, you give yourself the opportunity to do it again and again and more and better. Cause the other thing is once you start getting paid for something, you level up, you up your game. Like if you know, you're getting paid for a talk versus a talk that you can give for free, you're like, well, I could phone this one in cause I'm not getting anything for it. But if you go and you're like, I'm getting paid for this. This is my job. This is my brand. This is my reputation. You're going to level up. You're going to go in giving your best. And as you should, you should do it if you're getting nothing for it. You should always do your best. But you will come with a different type of energy when you know you're getting your worth. Like we've been, I don't know, everyone maybe not, but you've been in opportunities where you see someone getting paid and you're like, why are they getting paid more than me when I feel like I'm doing more work or I'm doing better work or what have you? That dichotomy in thinking just, again, it makes you feel bad. simply, it just doesn't make you feel good. So if you're not charging your worth and you still have to do the work, you're not going to feel good. You're going to lose that motivation. You're going to lose that energy. And I'm, 
I'm speaking again specifically to your audience here who are doing such good work, who are focused on social impact, don't do anything that could potentially take away your motivation and your energy and your strength. Charge what you're worth because you deserve it and you deserve to keep doing it. And you will be able to keep doing it if you get paid for it. So make sure you're charging your worth. Oh, that's such a good message. And I, and I think that it's all back to that idea of passion and your why and why are you even doing this in the first place? And a lot of the times we want to say yes to those free gigs because it's helpful to get us closer to that why or we see it in the greater vision of like, mm -hmm. fits in, I can make it fit in. But you're right, you know, the, the value that there might not fit in with the vision. <laughs> and you have to really make sure it all fits together. So um, a good, this is such a good episode, man. I'm just like so excited about it. And I, the last question I had for you, um, with all the stuff that you explained that you do on this podcast and where people might see themselves plugging into what you're creating, how can people know, one, if they should connect with you, two, how to connect with you? Like, where can they actually find you? Um, easiest way to find me, go to my website, cliftoncorbin.com. Um, I, like I said, my focus has been on helping parents and kids. So I created a workbook there that kind of gives kids that early introduction to like money recognition and, and all of these fun, like budgeting and all the fun money concepts at an early age. You can go to cliftoncorbin.com slash workbook. And that's free. That's free to download. It's a fun principal activity for kids. Um, you can email me, hello at cliftoncorbin.com if you've got questions about, you know, financial literacy in general. My books, Your Kids, uh, Their Money is available on pretty much all the platforms, Amazon, Kindle, Audible, Barnes & Noble, all the different places. Um, and you can find some of my, I've been taking a step back a little bit from the social media just because if I'm creating for social media, I'm not creating the other content. So. Most of my posting has been on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, it's uh, CD Corbin uh, is my handle on LinkedIn. So you can find me usually on LinkedIn if you want to connect. And it, if you should connect, if you want to talk more about financial literacy for parents, for kids, if you want to have me come and talk to you, uh, talk to your parent community, talk to your school, uh, I'm available. And like I said, just email me, hello at cliftoncorbin.com. Yeah, and also don't forget to get the books, man. <laughs> <laughs> and they're on Amazon, right? Both. They are on Amazon. Uh, Your Kids, Their Money. I've got an audio version of that. So you can get that on Audible. You can get it on Amazon, digital Kindle. And then The Richest Man in Babylon, revised for modern times. Um, you might have to look for my name because there's other versions of it out there. But if you look for my name, Clifton Corbin, as the editor, uh, it's got like a, almost like an ocean scene with like a gold coin in the bottom uh, in the sand. Uh, that one's only available on Amazon right now. So both the print and the digital is there. And just so people know how scary Amazon is, before I even knew that Clifton had edited this book, I was already recommended this That's book what I like on to hear. Amazon. <laughs> and I was like, and then I saw it in my LinkedIn feed and I saw Clifton's post that said he had done it. And I was, I put the two and two together. I was like, either you gremlins are living in my phone <laughs> yeah, or yeah. This is like legit content I should be reading <laughs> I wasn't sure which one it was, but it was, it was awesome to see um, you having success with yet another project. So I was excited. Thank you for that. that. Yeah, no, it was good. It was, it was really funny. I, I just was like, Amazon's listening to my conversations. They know I'm trying to get clicked on this podcast. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, those algorithms, man, they, they know what we're doing. Yeah, they're, they're, they're running deep on my phone. So I just thought it was hilarious, but, um, but I appreciate you being here. And it's been such a fun episode. We covered a whole bunch of things in this episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. But also, if you're interested in financial literacy and helping the next generation to um, be, you know, a little more knowledgeable, maybe than some of us got in our lifetimes, this is a great resource to either connect with Clifton, read the book, get the workbook, any of those things, but also just to make sure that you're doing the work of sharing this with the young people. So thanks for being here, Clifton. It's great. Thanks to for see having you. me, Wendy. It was so good to see you, too. I, uh, yeah. I hope we get to do this again sometime soon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We should just just for the fun piece. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Social Impact Level Up podcast. It's been awesome to interview today's guest, and I hope that you leave inspired to take action. If you're looking for any of the information we spoke about, it's probably down in the show notes. Make sure that you're checking them out and you're clicking on any of the links that seem exciting to you. If you are looking for a coach or a consultant to help you with your social impact or your sustainability, reach out to me via my website, hop on my email list, or jump into one of my programs. All of the links are below. So excited to have you as part of the collective. 
make sure that you come back and join us for another episode next week.